explained because ultimately what we're dealing with is losing the North American model of wildlife conservation. It's not the Montana model, it's not the Iowa model, it's the North American model. Because we can be on the offensive for ourselves instead of being on the defensive all the time. Welcome to the Built to Hunt podcast brought to you by the team of hunt advisors at the Hunt and Fool magazine, where we are dedicated to helping our members go on more hunts with better information. Join Hunt and Fool today at huntandfool.com. Well, welcome to another Built to Hunt podcast today. We've got a special guest joining Jessica and myself here uh, virtually uh, over the joys of the internet. But we have the CEO of How for Wildlife, Mr. Charles Whitwam. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, good pronunciation of the of my last name there. Uh, thank you both, Austin and Jess, for having me on. I'm really looking looking forward to talking to you guys today. Of course, there's there's so much um, I'll call it noise in the industry uh, about conservation, about management, about what states are doing good and bad, and politicians and there's so many moving parts these days, it's hard to keep up with everything. And so that's why we've been very attracted to your organization and the great things you guys are doing. Obviously, we know some of your members, some of your board, and we've got little bits and pieces, but we wanted to go to the source and get some straight answers today. Sounds good. I'll do my best. I, <laughs> I, I do have COVID right now as a caveat, so if my voice gets super scratchy, um, that's why. I got it. No problem. We'll we'll forgive you for that. <laughs> That's you. not a problem at all. Thank you. You're uh, you're speaking for the wildlife, right? Howling for the wildlife, yeah. if I may, <laughs> and for hunters and sportsmen. And you, you've got a lot on your plate. We appreciate that. So, tell us a little bit of the history, the backstory of this. Why another organization? Why this organization? Why was it needed? Um, personally, I was involved in in some bills in California. The first one was in 2018. And what I mean involved with bills is there was just, there was a bill that I didn't like and I wanted people to do something about it. And I felt like there wasn't enough being done. And I've always looked at it from the side of there's so many hunters out there who just aren't activated or we're not activists, which is essentially what we're trying to do is make hunters become activists. Is how for wildlife, but um, so back then, I'm like, how come nobody's making noise about this bill? I don't get it, and it was something that was going to affect me, um, sort of personally to one of my passions in hunting. So I just started making noise and getting people involved and getting on podcasts and making calls and um, not, and and this isn't, I'm not trying to. Um, to be negative about the hunting organizations who are out there or the lobbyists or whoever in California, I just felt like I could do something more. So, um, that's sort of where I first started learning about, I guess what you would call a grassroots effort with in, in hunting and just saying, Hey, we, we each have a voice and we can all make that heard in, Here's how you do that. Um, and then it came back again big time in 2020. There was a bill to ban bear hunting in California. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just kind of freaked out. I, I don't know. It was, it was on the, so personally, I'm like, God, I really, I'm getting into black bear hunting and California is a fantastic state to black bear hunt. No way are they going to take this from us. Honestly, that's just how I went at it screw this. So I called a bunch of people. I called John Stallone, who's now a part of, of Hall for Wildlife, just sort of complaining, you know, like, crap, there's this bill from the senator in San Francisco to ban bear hunting. This isn't good. Because we're at a disadvantage in California, at least that's the way I've always looked at it. And I made a bunch of calls to every hunting organization that I knew and hunting company and every hunter that I knew. And I said, we need to make a bunch of noise about this right now. Here's the emails. Here's the phone calls. Here's what's going on. Um, I looked at it as there's 82 million sportsmen in the United States. There's however many, you know, million in California. What if we all said something? What if we all actually got involved? That caught like wildfire. 
And mm-hmm. in five days, that bill was killed. There was something like 27,000 people either emailed or made calls or, and it went, you know, to Meat Eater and it went to all these different organizations. It just spread like wildfire. And mm-hmm. um, so I learned a little bit about with that bill, um, the the committees that it was sending on and, and who the decision makers are and, and all that. And I felt like there was a gap. Um, there was a, an empty space in our world where, yeah, we have action centers, we have organizations that represent hunters. But what I wanted was an organization that gets hunters to sort of represent themselves. Let's pull the curtain and say, if you want to get involved, here's exactly, here's the tools to do it. If you want to send an email, you don't have to search for what email to for who to send it to. You don't even have to search for what to send. Um, if you want to make a phone call and that all seems like easy stuff, but when you have, you know, committees with 18 decision makers on it or, or more that can be time consuming and people just don't take a lot of fact is people just don't take a lot of time to do something if it's not simple, right? If they have to figure it out, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so that was, I set out on a course to kind of, um, to just create an easy button for sportsmen. And that was sort of, that was the first stage. And then it moved into, wow, we can really make a difference at commission meetings, like wildlife commission meetings, but hunters never show up to it. The only people who show up are the organizations that we pay to represent us, which is great. And they're standing there saying, you know, we have 30,000 people and I speak on behalf of them. And I'm looking at it going, well, why don't we get the 30,000 people to show up? Like that's what the anti hunters do. And they have, they bust people in and they make a lot of noise. Um, they apply pressure really well. Uh, so I mirrored, I wanted to mirror what, what the anti hunting organizations have done so well. And that's, that's what we're working on. And then a year later, so that, that happened in that bill was 2020. Um, and I started working on, uh, let's see, was the bill 2020 or was it 2021? No, it was 2021. I started working on Hall for Wildlife at the beginning of 2021 after that bill was killed and launched it in January of 2022. So it took about a year for me to figure out um, everything that I felt was, was ready, at least for a start, to to get this whole thing going, to provide an easy button for the, for the hunting community. And, um, now we're a year, we're a year and I guess almost two months in. That's awesome. Now that started in California, that's where that first came up, but how many States are you guys tracking or keeping up on this now in the U S well, essentially every state. (laughs) Um, but it, it, it kind of depends on, where the hot button topics are, where the big issues are. So we're certainly open to, to every state. Recently it's been Montana has been a huge state. Mm-hmm. Um, because so for a number of reasons, um, one of the things we do is we try to connect with the boots on the ground organizations that are in the state. So in Montana, there's a number of organizations there and recently a coalition that's been formed between, you know, their, their guides and their trappers and, and you name it, they've formed a coalition. They reached out to us about a year ago now was kind of the initial conversation, but more recently they reached out to us and said, we really, the one thing we're missing is your tools and you guys do a really good job at getting people involved. And we have a bunch of bills here that we would like to get passed. How do we work together? So that's kind of the, the method I, I try to, to follow in every state is build those relationships and then give those organizations our tools um, to, to just magnify their voice. And, and, and so yeah. are they the ones that help you write those responses? If you don't mind oh, me asking, yeah. I'm just, yeah. Okay. So I was curious, like, how do you come up with 
like on one of the recent Montana ones, I think it was 77. Another one was a hundred. Like it's so impressive that you guys have the bandwidth and commitment and passion to come up with that many responses. And then with one click, I can contact 30 to 50 people that yeah. need to hear us. Yeah. So they, so I have a couple of uh, writers. They're, I mean, essentially they're kind of investigative journalists. Someone, somebody will contact us with an issue. Um, if it, I'll look into it and say, yeah, this seems like something worth looking into. So they'll go interview whoever they need to interview to really pull apart the details of the bill. Um, they make connections or, you know, I already have, you know, sources and, and or connections in different States. I'll say, Hey, talk to this guy. Cause he's, you know, uh, he's the game warden or he's, he's the liaison for this or that. And, and he'll be able to, to answer a lot of these questions on, on a state level and give you the details that we need. Um, so they'll, they'll write up everything that I need so I can bring it to the website and present it to the public. So when you're talking about the 77 emails, they'll generally give us 10 to 15 emails that, um, cover different bases and what we do is we turn those into we take those 10 or 15 and turn those into 70 or 100 or or whatever and we do the same thing with subject lines and you might not know it as a user so when you go to our site and you see the email that's provided for you um, that's just one of many and as a whole kind of as a pack the whole how for wildlife thing that's how I see it. The 10,000 foot view is if we have, you know, thousands of people participating in this, we're having thousands of different messages get sent from different angles. So it's not all the same thing. Um, a lot of people, they still don't know that unless they, they read the details that, you know, one of 77 messages are getting sent or whatnot. Um, but it's still, but you still have the, the opportunity. You can edit your own message. You can write whatever you want, which is great. But again, most people, have it. Most people don't. They just, they just don't. So a lot of it is they have to trust us. Um, hopefully they read the intros and they read the bills and they, they listen to the podcast. So they're really making an informed decision. And then they'll look at the email we've provided and they're like, okay, yeah, I get that. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll send that. So it does take a lot of time on our end to, to build that. But the reasoning for that is that it's not, it's so much more powerful because it's a personalized message from you. So, so whatever your email address is, the decision maker on the other side, they're seeing it coming from you because it is coming from you and sure. Yeah. Not your website, not your domain, the same consistent organization. Yeah. Hall's not mentioned whatsoever. So again, it's, it's like, we're just sort of the catalyst to get you to that person to deliver that message. Um, Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Charles, let me ask you a question, and I'll show some ignorance here in representation. Um, But it's easy to sometimes say, well, that's in a different state. They're not going to listen to me. Is They're not my elected official, you know, because most of these are state-level issues and bills. Yeah. How how can I look at that properly? So we've taken out um, a part of the strategy here is for state level, we've taken out all of the roadblocks that would traditionally exist where you have to put in your zip code and your address, and then it connects you with that specific legislator or whatever. Um, It's a manual process on our end to be able to do this. So when such and such senator or representative sees their email and email come in, all they're seeing is your name and email address. So they don't know. Got it. Now they might come back and ask, or they might not. Um, and you know, if they do come back and ask, and this is something, this is another thing we're working on because I am, I'm having a problem um, convincing hunters on why they should get involved in other states' issues, right? And they keep asking. They're like, "Man, I'd love to get involved in this, but it's not my state." Like, all right. Well, I guess my, my, my messaging hasn't been, it hasn't, uh, it, it's not as, uh, not doing as well as I thought it would. So one, 
one reason I think people should get involved as non-residents is just look at non-resident uh, license sales. Um, take Colorado, yeah. for instance. Um, I think I think non-residents provide more than 50% of CPW's revenue there. Um, mm-hmm. And you can, you know, go down the list. So it's super important, I think, for the legis. So if they do get back with you and they're like, do you live in this state? No, but I hunt there. And here's some facts on how much non-residents provide to your community, whether it's through hunting sales or whether it's through, I guess what you'd call tourism, you know, hotels and, and, you know, eating out or going to Walmart, whatever. It's just, it's supporting the economy there. So my dollars are spent there. It's different than like a state issue um, that we vote on, on, I don't know what our school taxes go to. That affects, that affects people that live in that state. And for me, if I'm in Michigan or whatever else, I could care less what you're doing with your school taxes in, in that state. However, if I go to your state <laughs> and I'm actually spending money there and I go there for two weeks a year or more and I'm trapping and I'm hunting, I'm actually a pretty, I'm a big part of your budget and your funding there specifically in this case for wildlife. So that's why I think we should be involved. The reason I first started this is because this is what anti hunters do. So um, you'll see the same people in Washington State and Colorado, and the same representatives and the same organizations, and even the same people. Um, so if they can do it, then why can't we? You know, um, you'll you'll certainly see. I'm sure, as you as you guys know, what happens on the West Coast if they get something passed in California where you can't hunt mountain lions or you can't hunt bears or Mm -hmm. whatever, they're not going to stop there. They're going to go to another state. So it's a domino effect for them and it's a domino effect for us, or we can rebuild the blocks. So again, back to the 82 million sportsmen in the United States, we need to have each other's backs because at some point it's going to be at your doorstep, no matter what state you're in. And, um, if we're, you know, over the line or, or, you know, (laughs) crossing some, some boundaries of, you know, out of state interactions with legislators, then so be it. I think, I think it can be reasonably explained because ultimately what we're dealing with is losing the North American model of wildlife conservation. It's not the Montana model. It's not the Iowa model. It's the North American model. And, um, that's a that's kind of a tidal wave that's building if we let it so we got to be we got to be just as prepared um and have our army built as well and that's the one thing we're i don't think we've done a good job at we have more people we have more money but we are not as involved as as the other side for sure so how do you guys decide as an organization what merits putting it on the website and taking action on it is that voted upon or suggested or where do you draw that line um yeah that's a good i mean there's nothing really set in stone um i tend to put predator hunting or trapping some of the the low-hanging fruit i kind of prioritize prioritize those because um that's what the anti hunters are going after first because they think that's the easiest to go after. And I feel like the more hunters, no matter if you trap or not, or if you're into predator hunting or not, or, you know, bear hunting or whatever, we can still support that even if that's not your thing. So if we can get thousands or tens of thousands of people behind something like trapping, which traditionally just isn't there, um, that makes it harder for the other side to complete their mission. Um, mm-hmm. So anything with predators, anything with, with I'm kind of playing their game, you know, do you know what I mean? So it, there's, there's strategy there. Um, if we can hold them off on trapping, then they got to spend more resources on that, which sucks for them. Right. If, yep. if we didn't show up, um, Things like trapping, which don't get a lot of attention and most people don't know a lot about, um, they'd be 
kind of wiped off the block a little bit easier. And I think, you know, they would get those victories a lot, a lot easier. And um, I think you saw that in places like California um, and last year in, in Colorado with the mountain lion ban. Um, so many people showed up and it was unexpected. Um, we've certainly had some losses too. I mean, Washington state is just a, an absolute disaster yeah. right now, but because I think of Hunter involvement, it's lasted this long. Like if we didn't show up, if hunters didn't show up a year ago now in, you know, th literally thousands of them, um, I think that whole spring bear thing that would have been settled last spring. And yep. it's still, there's been a lot of momentum that's, that's, you know, it's not really in our favor. It's, it's certainly not in our favor, but now there's lawsuits against the governor. Now there's lawsuits against the commission. And I don't think we would have gotten to that point had hunters not been so involved in that battle there, because now we're starting to think, okay, why can't we sue? You know, they, they sue us all the time. How come we're not doing that? So it's just, it's just getting that mentality that we can do the same thing, you know, and maybe we have more people, maybe there are polls that say, you know, 80% of Americans are against, uh, you know, trophy hunting. Well, maybe those are a little biased and a little skewed <laughs> because I don't think that accurately represents what, um, what most people think in the United States. We just, we have a huge problem with outreach. We have a huge problem with getting our message out to the non-hunting public. Um, we just speak in our echo chambers all the time. The other side, they do a really good job at getting their message out to the normal citizens, you know, and, and here's what trophy hunting is. And they take, they take, they take control of the narrative and we don't. Yeah. They're good at it. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm glad that there's somebody to represent us on the other side, kind of meet a, meet them. I don't know they've had enough. Well, they haven't had enough pushback. I feel like you guys are actually matching that, which is really cool. So I connected with you. I didn't realize how soon I'd met you after you launched this. Mm -hmm. I guess it was February of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and when it was announced at Winter Strong, kind of the, the things that you were working on at the time, everybody was – hollering and excited it was just really cool to have that energy surrounding those particular cases since then are there any that stand out to you and I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot to toot your own horn but I want you to feel comfortable doing that because you are making a difference <laughs> so do you mean like um what victories we've had or what do you, what yeah do you, yeah oh. so what what do you feel like your f like what cases really stand out to you where it's like I know I made a difference in that. I know that Howell like moved that needle. Oh. Are there any that stand out to you? Yeah. I, I would probably have to go through our, we have an archive list on our, on our website of past actions. Cause there's, there's honestly, there's been so many of them, but, um, Arizona, um, had a, a predator hunting ban. And I know for a fact from contacts there from the commissioners there who were so impressed with the hunters that showed i think we had on that first meeting there was maybe 127 hunters i think that showed up and at first everyone was worried because they're like wait a second hunters are going to show up and trappers are going to show up what are these guys going to say you know <laughs> and um a part of what we do is get people prepared for these meetings so we'll have kind of training meetings and, and over zoom like hey here's how the commission meetings work here's how you address the commissioners here's talking points on what to say please don't engage the anti-hunters because they'll try and draw you in just go in with with your first with what you have written down what you're going to say don't respond to to them and just be super polite and leave because those guys on the other side they're going to make fools of themselves and they do they yell. They've even spit on somebody recently in Colorado. And it's just like, hey, that's not doing them any good. So just <laughs> representing ourselves is huge. Um, in Colorado, there's been, and, and I want to be clear, like this, it, it's not, this is a, 
a partnership with many different, you know, individuals and organizations. It's not all how for sure. This is just sure. no, no, I know. in addition to what's out there. Um, we're giving tools to the individuals so they can have, so they can go in with confidence um, on, on how to address an issue and make their, make their voice heard. Um, but in Colorado, there was a, uh, like a hunter education bill that was passed um, that basically puts hunter education in, I think, seventh grade um, classes in throughout Colorado um, public education. That was a huge one. I know Colorado uh, CBA, Colorado Bow Hunters Association was the main drivers of that. Um, but we helped them get a lot of signatures and, and make a lot of make a lot of noise on that. Um, obviously in, in California, we had another bear petition by the Humane Society. Um, this was last spring where basically the Humane Society wanted to put bear hunting on hold, uh, because they questioned the science. Um, that got completely shot down by our California commission who is appointed by governor Newsom who most people don't think is very hunter friendly, but uh, hunters and sportsmen did a fantastic job representing themselves, answering the commission's questions and not freaking out like the other side did during those public meetings. Um, we were just polite and represented ourselves, represented ourselves well. Um, there was a big, there was like a dog bill in New Hampshire. <laughs> that probably wouldn't have got a lot of attention otherwise. Um, and it was to essentially ban the training of, of dogs. And um, for what an odd thing for, to fight for, hun for. for hunting. Yeah. And uh, we made a bunch of noise on that. And one of the God, I should have had I should have had it ready. But one of the I think he was a congressman. I can't remember. He had somehow found out that this was coming from Howe, and he emailed me. And he said, I don't know what's going on, but we're a really small committee, and um, this is way too much pressure, and this thing would have passed. But you guys, like, I don't know what your intentions were, but Machiavelli would have been proud. Like, they were just over, absolutely overwhelmed. They thought it was a shoe in kind of a thing and where'd all these hunters come from all of a sudden and they didn't want to deal with the pressure. Um, Georgia had a number of bills last year where, you know, I'll tune into the Senate hearings where they're going over bills and this, I think the speaker or whatever stood up at the beginning of this, of this hearing. And he said, how's everyone's emails looking right now? Like, have you guys ever seen this before? Because again, it's not a it's not a form letter, you know, and the subject lines they're getting they're not the same either, and so it's a really personal thing. So they're looking at it, going, "Wow, there, there's a lot of people paying attention to this bill. This has never happened." Because traditionally, their staff would you can put in a filter, right? You start getting the same email in, you just filter it, and it goes to the same email box. You can't filter our our emails. It's very hard to because they're constantly randomized. Um, so that was a, that was pretty awesome to hear, um, in Canada recently. Um, I don't know if you guys took part in that, but a lot of the, the members of parliament were emailing residents of the United States back with long emails of like in response to your specific email that you sent them, not just a canned message. You know, and people, I get sent interactions all the time, like, hey, look at this from this guy that, and now we have this conversation going. So we're kind of building a yeah, dialogue, yeah, it's, it's, which is nice. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, you know, to me, that's the success is, is that, that dialogue and that relationship and changing for some people who have this idea of who a hunter is, oh, wow, you're a you're an intelligent person and you can, I didn't know. Here's, here's one thing in, in Colorado. Um, I can't remember her name, but she was on the committee for the, 
the mountain lion band that was making the decision on that. She brought up about how she learned about the North American model <laughs> through these emails. Mm -hmm. And she didn't really know much about it before. And she said she was really educated through the interaction that she got from hunters. And she was really, um, um, she just celebrated that. That was cool. You know, that's, that's the success because this is a long, this is a long road in front of us. And we have to literally change the mind of Americans, not hunters. Like we have to stop trying to change our own minds because we already, why are we trying to convince, you, you know, we're all on the same page here. It's the 80% out there who has no idea about hunting or has this idea of trophy hunting that they've been told. And we haven't been given a chance to refute that. So that's, yeah. that success comes when we can, when we can change their minds and then it makes these anti-hunting organizations who are really nothing more than a giant fundraising pack. Um, it makes them irrelevant because if they can't, if they can't get the hearts and, and minds, you know, through the emotional heartstrings that they pull with their commercials on TV or, you know, videos that they show, um, if, if that's challenged, that's going to, that's going to go away for them. And I, I honestly think we can do that. Like that's the end goal. That's what success is us actually going out of business. That's what I want to do. Is because business. you're no longer relevant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I like that. I do too. Uh, I would rather a go little bit about... all the time than doing this. Yeah. Believe it. <laughs> <laughs> then looking at another bill that's taken away another opportunity. Yeah. Without science. Yeah. What, tell me a little bit about just taking action, using your email tools, um, keeping up to date versus a membership for Health for Wildlife. Tell me, what are my options? I'm listening to this. I'm interested. What can I do? Um, so taking action right now, I've, I've cleaned up a lot of the actions. I think there's only, there's like Montana and maybe two others on there. There's four or five actions um, that are currently live, but with that, you go to howforwildlife.org, go to the button that says take action, and you'll see all the current live actions. Um, to complete those, probably takes about five seconds each. Um, it's your first name, last name, and email address. You can sign up for free, which basically creates an account for yourself. Um, and that keeps track of what you're doing. Because sometimes, like two weeks ago, we had probably 15 actions up um but we've gotten through a, a ton of those but it keeps track of what actions you've done and what actions you haven't done and it also a lot of these actions will move from phase one to phase two to phase three because they'll move through different committees they'll go from like a natural resources committee and then go to the full house and then to the senate and then you know to the governor's desk each one of those to us is a new action because there's different eyes looking at this now right mm -hmm. um so when you create an account and you go to what's called the member hub it'll literally tell you right there if it's if there's a drop down completed not completed and you can see which ones you've completed and not completed so you can sort of keep track of that and then when it refreshes when it goes to the next phase it'll say uncompleted so you'll know oh i need to go do that again um as far as the membership goes if you want to you know, pay for a membership. There's various, like a Howl for Wildlife membership is $30 a year. And it's basically just, you know, supporting us. You'll get discount codes to certain um, uh, partners that we work with. And we'll have, you know, like monthly contests where you can win, you can win prizes. Um, we have a Pope and Young membership, which is basically you're just getting a Howl and a Pope and Young membership for the price of the Pope and Young membership. So you get both. Um, we're going to have some more too. We got a bunch of other kind of partnership memberships um, coming. But yeah. No, it's so it, I think it's interesting for me because I, I can see a lot of hunters saying, well, I'm already a member of my local sportsman group or I'm already donating or whatever. So I'm good. But yeah. to your point is, this is a way to represent yourself and stay informed on your own level 
That's one thing I yeah. took. And the second is you are working with those organizations oftentimes. Oh, yeah. Lockstep to help them empower what they're doing. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. So we are now on a number of different state coalitions where it's comprised of state organizations and national organizations. And, and there it's kind of, we just, we get together and we talk about issues that are coming, bills that are coming up, what we can do about them. And there's steering committees and there's, you know, advocacy committees. We're just trying to do what's best for what's coming down the pipe. Um, but then oftentimes a lot of those issues are getting, so to answer your question, how we come up with some of our actions, it comes from that, those conversations as well. Like, Hey, how can you help with Oregon's, um, right to food, right to hunt, right? The trap, right? The forage bill. Um, because you guys do such a good job at getting individuals involved. We're going to be there representing as organizations, but can you help us? get hunters there and you know to represent themselves because that's that's really what we are so it's kind of like we're like the people's organization i guess right <laughs> um it's just an addition it's just there's a there's a big army out there that has really never been used like has not been activated um and i really think that's the key to to our success is if we can activate all these people and make them essentially make them activists we're going to be so much stronger than than what we've t traditionally been now tell me what what's wrong with us in your opinion your professional opinion what is wrong with us as hunters do we just not care are we complacent are we um what is it no because there's no difference between it's humanity right They're, humans are all the same so it's not like hunters are any different I don't think in the past hunters really knew how to get involved. I didn't like, you know what I mean? Like if something was going on in another state, maybe there was an action for it. But most times when I would go to it, the action was set up wrong because they wanted my address. And I'm like, all right, well, I live in California. And then I'd fill it out and I'd get an auto reply that says your local legislator isn't in the district of Iowa or whatever. So I'm like, all right, well, that didn't do any good. So it was super limiting. And those were the things I wanted to, to get around. So I think there was a lot of discouragement where hunters want to get involved, but they just didn't know how to. So we're trying to take all those roadblocks out. Now, I mean, sure, I can complain, but it's not really specific to hunters. It's just how humans are. Yeah, there's a lot of egos and there's a lot of arguments that go back and forth. Um, and there's certainly some some miseducation. Um, I'll, I'll take California, for instance. Um, everyone wants to blame the department for why we can't hunt mountain lions or why we don't have spring bear hunting or why we can't use hounds to hunt bear. The department has nothing to do with that. They are the biologists that work for the state who give recommendations to the commission and also um mountain lion hunting was taken away through the legislature so the yeah. people of california voted on that the department had nothing to do with that they can't change it but there's a lot of hunters who they shame the department because we can't mountain lion hunt I'm like okay it's just not the way it works so let's Let's start, yeah. let's start there. So, because a lot of what the department does, we need to get behind and support them. They're trying okay. to help us. They have the data there. They've got the numbers. They have the science. We can use that to our advantage, but it's not going to do us any good if we're just blaming the, the department for every problem we have here in California, because it's simply just not true. Do you feel like, I know this may be going down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but we've seen it here in Utah when the department or the commission doesn't seem to act or act soon enough, then we see the legislation jump in and, and start managing hunting that way. And obviously we would prefer it to happen at a agency level or at the commission, but do you see that just getting worse as we go forward? And is this how we combat that is fighting them at the action level at the Senate and house bill level? Well, if something is a is a 
is a Senate bill or a House bill. Um, that just depends on whoever the original petitioner was or whoever is creating the bill. Um, those are just different avenues to take, I guess. So let me give you an example. Um, the Humane Society with the 2021 bear bill, they found an author, Senator Weiner, in San Francisco. Um, they found an author of a bill, which was a Senate bill, to do away with bear hunting. Um, that didn't work out for them. Their next move was to submit a petition um, to the California Commission um, to end bear hunting until the department could come back with um, a bear management plan based on modern science because they said it wasn't based on modern science and that got completely thrown out. So it's not, so what I mean is like, it's, it's not like if it doesn't get addressed in the commission or doesn't get addressed, you know, at the department level that it's going to move forward to the Senate is it just depends on how it's introduced. And, and that that's for us too. So for bills like uh, right to hunt bills, there's strategy to it. We can go through, we can try to go through the Senate go through the legislator legislature um, to get something passed. Um, or we can try and go through the ballot box um, to get something like that passed. And those are, so mm -hmm. it just depends on what you think will work and how much money you have to spend on things like that. So those are just the different, the different avenues that you can take um, to get those things done. So back to what you were saying in, in Utah, if you feel like the commission isn't acting on something, then I would reach out to, if you don't know how to do it, um, reach out to one of your local sportsmen's organizations and say, how do we submit a petition to the commission to hear this issue? And cause there's a, it's, it's the same thing that the humane society or these other organizations do. And we have to get better at that learning how to do that. Cause we can be on the offensive mm -hmm. for ourselves instead of being on the defensive all the time. Right. One of the biggest reasons that I wanted to have you on as a guest is the subject of being proactive and not reactive. Right. A lot of times things get passed and then people want to have a voice and then people want to complain and all of a sudden care. <laughs> I mean, I think they always care. Right. But, um, it goes back to thinking that, uh, well, I don't think that I'll make a big difference or I don't know how. And there's, first of all, knowledge is power. How you use that is more powerful. And then there's power in numbers. And so I think that you accomplish all those things. Um, but that subject particularly was the probably the driving force of having you on and just showing people that there is a way to be proactive. It's really easy through this avenue. And then maybe we, we won't hear so much on our end because <laughs> we, you know, we're a membership based organization and we do, we hear it a lot. Um, people just complaining after the fact and not getting involved right. soon enough. Well, it's really common. Yeah, no, that's, that's extremely common. Um, you know, I would love to be on a part of every issue that comes up. I think we'll get to that point. Every important issue that comes up, there are, there are some, to be honest with you, there are some issues that, you know, senators are just, they'll bring up and it's basically, they're just doing it for their constituency. The bill has mm -hmm. zero chance of passing at all. Um, or they'll even bring up a bill that goes against the state's constitution, but they just want to show their constituency. I'm still fighting for you. It's more, <laughs> it's more, it's more a fundraising uh, uh, effort. And we try to stay away from that because I don't want to waste your time. Like I could post sure. every single bill. I have a program that shows me every bill that comes up by a keyword. And I could post all that and get people all excited and be like, the sky is falling, but it's not. You know what I mean? And like, then I would fall into the whole fundraising thing. Like, look at how good we're doing. We're on. So there's, there's definitely a, a balance to that. Um, we're trying to 
again, you know, be involved in the Bills either proactively or, of course, if we have to be on the defense, do that on on what we think has a chance um, to either pass or not get passed. You know, a really viable bill or issue that we we get involved in, not not some of the silly ones. There's some absolutely silly ones there that have no chance of going anywhere that people, I think, waste way too much time on. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's 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 also at the same time, it's hard to know, you know. It's hard to know this isn't <laughs> I haven't been involved in politics or anything like that. So I'm reliant on so many people and I have to trust so many people to give me the right information. And um, and that goes both ways. Um, but, you know, over the past year. It's uh, I've I've developed some pretty incredible trusting relationships with people who are kind of, you know, steering me in the right direction and who I trust what they're saying and they're giving me really really solid advice on on uh what to get involved with and and what not to get involved with um but back to what you're saying about being proactive that's extremely important for us to do that that's why like in montana right now i think they're leading the charge um they see what's coming montana is a fantastic state for for hunters right now um but they see what's coming. And so they're trying to put all these things in place. That's going to protect uh, the future of Montana hunting, not just for Montanans, but non-residents, anybody who comes there to protect the future of that uh, for, for perpetuity. Um, So that's why they're, they have a right to hunt and fish there currently, but they want to add the right to trap but it also, the amendment adds a protection to all current methods of take. So right now, a group could come in and take away bow hunting. That doesn't infringe on the right to hunt because you can still hunt. This is how the legal language works. You can still hunt in Montana, so it didn't infringe on your right to hunt. Okay, well, <laughs> this amendment is going to protect all of the current methods of take. And so now you can't come in and take away muzzle loader muzzle loaded hunting or or archery or trapping but the state the commission the department um still dictates based on science quotas and seasons and they can certainly take away you know if, if numbers are low for one species they can take away a hunting season that doesn't take away of their ability to do that so it's not like a right where it's like i can just go hunt whenever i want and i don't need a license no it's really protecting um that that method of it's safeguarding it from being taken away through through lawsuits or you know all the stuff that comes down the pipe um super super important and we're making we're making uh inroads there we're making a lot of noise there um to where I've now experienced for the first time, I was wondering when this was coming. I've got people contacting old businesses that I've started because they think I still own them. Um, and they're saying, we're going to boycott your business. You need to stick your, your nose out of Montana or, and all this and making all these threats. This has just happened in the last week, making all sorts of threats. I'm like, okay, here it comes. But this is good. This means... <laughs> this means you're doing something. Yeah, this means, somebody cares. <laughs> this means we're actually doing something. And then there's a video out there that um, I just saw yesterday about uh, how for wildlife and the NRA is working on this stuff together. And I'm like, what? I, I haven't talked to the NRA about any of this. I called the guy and I'm like, is the NRA <laughs> working with you guys on these bills? And he's like, no. And I'm like, they're just like, because it triggers people on their side, the NRA, oh my God, they're working with the NRA. And I'm like, they're just, this is what they're doing. So to me, this is great. You guys keep lying to your people. You guys keep lying to your fundraisers (laughs) because we're going to get to the point where we have enough money and we have enough resources where we can really start to pick apart that BS and expose that and put our own messages on billboards that are in San Francisco on the bridge that say 
super powerful messages about hunt, like, cause this is what's coming. This is what we're working on. Super, super powerful messages about hunting that lead, that leads them to websites that essentially shows the story of hunting and the success of hunting. And we're not selling hunting gear. We're not trying to convert people into hunting. We're showing how hunting is intrinsically human and why you should support hunting as a conservation effort, even if you don't want to become a hunter, you know, and, and what, what is this idea of trophy hunting? Show them what it really is. You know, that's our main goal here is to raise enough money. Like I want to spend all the money on the non-hunting public. That's it. Any money we get, that's our focus. That's well, that's how we like, that's how we change. That's how we change minds. Um, and, that, and I think where that's where the battles won and lost. It's certainly where it's, it's, it's won for the other side. You know, it's like 10% is for hunting, 10% against hunting and 80%. They have no idea. And it's like, that's fertile ground out there. Why don't we go after that fertile ground? Why don't we do that? And there's, there's so many different people who hunt. We don't tell their stories. Blood Origins is doing a great job at telling stories. And that's a, that's a huge start. Um, showing all the different people who hunt and why they hunt. Um, that's a huge, huge start. And uh, I love that. I love that kind of messaging. And we, we need more of that. But as a $5 billion a year industry, we can afford some mainstream TV commercials. We can afford some commercials on Hulu. We can afford some uh billboards in major cities that say simple things let's trigger people yeah. let's let's say hunting is conservation you know hunting is human something like that that's like what you know show that in a city where people would never see anything like that before and then lead them to a website not how for wildlife but lead them to a campaign website that shows the true story of hunting and the success of hunting yep. and where our conservation dollars go. Um, a did you know type thing. A did you know thing that, that so many hunters don't even know. You know, when you buy arrow That's shafts, powerful. I think it's like, what, 35 cents for every arrow shaft goes to PR dollars. Um, right. And, you know, 11% of pistols and rifles and all that, you know, goes to that. And then what does that money get used for? Um, there's so many stories to tell. And if we, I think if we concentrate on that, um, we might be able to get 10 or 15% that we otherwise wouldn't have reached. And that 10, 15%, that's a swing vote. For sure. There's so much power in education. I know that's, I always tend to complain when people don't show up to voice their opinion. And now you've given us a great avenue to voice our opinion, show support. And then I, I really complain about the people that get all upset, bent out of shape when it's already over with and they didn't do anything and they didn't know. So yeah, with the technology we have these days, with your website, with everything out there, it's your own fault if you don't know and you don't get involved. Like, no excuses, Jess. <laughs> well, we're working on it. I mean, it's, it's uh, frankly, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, it's, <laughs> I, seriously, I, it's, it's crazy. I just, I saw a space that, I don't know, I just got really passionate about it. And, you know, I'm learning every day and with the connections I make and the people I talk to, you know, how best do we do this? Um, I've never done anything like this before. So I don't, I don't, but somebody has to try. Um, and it's not. So yeah, I'm trying, but it's successful because of all the people that have been that have been involved. So That's awesome. So Jessica, like since Winter Strong last year, we've had um, over a million um, individual correspondents go to decision wow. go to um, decision makers, and um, so in a year, right? And that's that's a year, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's huge. Um, and that's just you know that's just building. And that's, that's really a testimony to, I think how hungry people are to get involved. Um, and we aren't even on the radar yet. I mean, we are, but we're not anything yet. You know, it's, it's, uh, I have a full-time job, 
right? So all this is part time and like a side project. It's like, yeah, it's something I'd love to do someday. I've never paid myself a cent for this. I've only funded this myself, right? So when we get to the point where there's actually resources and staff and a full team, that's when, you know, I think we can really start making some big, big differences when we can be in every corner um, of every issue and, and, if we have to bus people in, we'll bus people in. You know, it's when the magic happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, show up or shut up, right? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, heck, we sure appreciate your time explaining this. There's always when you see organizations pop up, you know, there's always that kind of squinted eye. What are they doing? Is this for me? Is this? Are they helping me? Are they self interest? So. Yeah. I sure appreciate the inside look at this um, because like you say, we all need it and we all know 10, 20, 30 hunters around us that are not educated on this and need to be involved. And there's power in numbers. Yeah. Well, it's free to use a hundred percent. So it doesn't cost you anything to take any action whatsoever. Um, so hopefully that's a hint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's great. So the best is to go on the website, howlforwildlife.org. Yeah. Find everything we need there. Yep. hundred percent. Instagram is howl underscore org. And that's where kind of everything initiates. Um, that's where honestly we're like, all the work has been done is just on Instagram. So, awesome. and the, yeah. And you do a good job following up on cases too. I've loved that about your page and following. Cause you know, it's easy to, throw money at something, whether it's a local chapter or a monthly, you know, cup of coffee for the price of a cup of coffee and that sort of thing. But it always feels better to know what's being done on the other side of that. And I don't know that there are other organizations that do it as well as you do. So yeah. it's easy to support that. Well, we're hyper-focused on it. So we're not doing anything else <laughs> except for these very few things that we do. Um, and, um, Thank you for that. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. But certainly one thing I've realized is communication is, and I'm not the best communicator, but I'll, I'm just like willing to do it. And um, people appreciate that. So uh, it fills in a lot of blanks when, when people have questions and they, and they reach out on Instagram, I try to get back to everybody. Because again, it's just building, it's building relationships and it's building trust. And um that certainly goes a long ways for sure. So I appreciate hearing that because that, it means it, that means it's, uh, we're making a difference, I think. That's awesome. Well, keep up the good work. We'll try to send some more members your way and increase those numbers to take action. Like you say, it's a probably a year round thing. There's always something to take action on, but definitely now during uh congressional sessions across the country, right? Yeah. Bill season is, it starts in January and I don't know it starts dying down in April and then, um, and then there's some holdouts after that. So, but yeah, during bill season, it's insane, which is right now. Awesome. <laughs> well, we'll let you get back to it. Good luck out there. And uh, we'll put all links to your website in the show notes here and we'll talk to you a little bit later. Awesome. And feel better soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> good to talk to you. Thanks. We'll see you. Have a good day. Yep, see you.